Good evening and welcome to the Spirit and Life Bible Study. My name is Jonathan. Our reader is Gwenda tonight. And our topic is the Lord knows the way. So if I can set this up a little bit at the beginning. Um, there are some theories in our world, are there not, uh, that if we are to improve ourselves, it's going to be entirely on our own shoulders. You know, it's that whole category of literature that's called self-help and um, there's some people who view the idea that religion is kind of a crutch and it's a crutch for people who are for whatever reason unwilling or don't think they're able to solve their own problems so they have to lean on the crutch of religion and so on. So there's a lot of that kind of what you might call self-sufficiency, uh, philosophy of self-sufficiency in our world. There's also uh, a philosophy in Christianity that, so that would be sort of the all self theory. Then there's the all God theory, which is that God is doing what he's doing and we're all on the tractor beam and we're all gonna, gonna uh, get there and, and whatever. And there's nothing we have to do. It's just all faith as long as we believe in the Lord will be carried there. I don't think either of these is uh, the truth, I think it's a combination of the Lord in partnership with us. But thankfully, thankfully in that partnership, the Lord is the one who knows the way. We, you know, we don't know where we are now. We don't know where heaven is. We don't know where we're going. Don't know always if we're on the right track or whatever. So it's comforting to me to think that the Lord knows how to get us there. Why don't we open with a prayer, good friends, if you care to join us. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are the one God of heaven and earth. We thank you, Lord God, for bowing down the heavens and coming to be among us, the Word made flesh. We pray for insight into your Word and what it is that you're teaching us tonight, Lord about how you lead us, about our freedom and our response. Amen. Thank you, friends. Sending out greetings to those of you who are online, those of you who are getting audio or on the phone and so on. Sending blessings to all of you. And let me read you something that I read periodically here about what we're doing. Spirit and Life Bible Study, the purpose of this Bible study. We look at the Bible through a Swedenborgian lens meaning in alignment with the teachings of Emanuel Swedenborg, born 1688, died 1772. The name spirit and life comes from Jesus himself, who says that his words are spirit and they are life. Spirit, which we take to mean that his words have a spiritual and heavenly meaning and purpose, and life meaning that his words are alive and aim to bring us to life by teaching us how we are to live if we wish to become spiritual and heavenly. And since Jesus is the word made flesh, what he says of his words applies to all the words of the Bible, we believe. They all teach who he is and how to get from hell to heaven. So that's some little impression of what we're doing here. And we will be looking at scriptures tonight on the subject of the Lord knowing the way. There's a very strong refrain in scripture, as you may have seen, good friends, about the way. Isn't there that story in the Old Testament about how the children of Israel are down in Egypt and then they have to want, there's this long sojourning and this wandering to get home and so on. And as you may remember in the epistles, in the Acts and epistles, uh, Christianity in its early time was referred to as the way. That was the name for Christianity. And so this idea of a way or a journey is a very strong metaphor and it's something that exists not just in Christianity in the Bible, but Aren't there so many movies with this sense of the hero's journey and the arc of life and this kind of thing? You know, there's a sense that we're going from A to B. That's what we're doing here on this planet. Uh, but do we know where we're going? Do we know uh, what's going on or are we making progress? You know, sometimes I imagine you feel as I do that I'm not sure, you know, Am I on the right track? Is this the right way to go? Should I put a lot more effort in than I'm putting in now and, and so on? So I found it comforting just recently to think of the Lord as knowing the way. It's not necessary for me to know the way as long as I have some sense of 
knowing the Lord and being able to follow him, then he'll figure it out from there. It sort of leads us from wherever we are. Let's have a look. Let's start in Exodus. We'll, we'll go from one side of the Bible to the other. Let's start in Exodus chapter 13. These are just different passages that came to mind along these lines. Exodus chapter 13, verse 20, is on the very verge of the children of Israel coming out of the land of Egypt and heading to the Holy Land. And we hear about this method by which they were led. This is even before the Ten Commandments were given. There was something else that was leading them. What is that in verse 20 there? So they took their journey from Succoth and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way. Oh, to lead the what? <laughs> to lead the way. To lead the way. Isn't it interesting that it uses the word way there? Uh, he went before them in a pillar of cloud. And go ahead. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So isn't that interesting? There's a different purpose of the cloud. The purpose of the cloud is to lead the way, and the purpose of the fire is to give them light. Go on. So as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And as far as we know from Scripture, this is what led them all those times. It explains, I think, at the end of the book of Numbers, that when the pillar of fire or cloud would move, then the children of Israel would move, and when it would stay still, they would stay still. This is what they followed. So before there was even the Ten Commandments, there was this method of leading, to lead them in the way. And isn't it implied in there that the Lord knows the way and is going to guide them from wherever they are? I love that image, that wherever we are, the Lord, the Lord is not in some other nation on a mountain thousands of miles away trying to whisper into the wind, come here and I will lead you. You know, if we're in the desert, he's right there. He's right there with us leading us. And another important part of the imagery, some of you may be familiar with this idea of correspondence, is the cloud is an image in Scripture of the literal meaning of Scripture itself. So it's very interesting to me that the cloud which led them by day, the purpose of the cloud was to lead them, to lead the way. And there's something about being led by the word that I think is very important. Tricky, but, but important. Whereas the fire by night was to give them light. It's just a slightly different, slightly different function. So to give them light at night and to lead them. So when it's day, you move forward with your life and when it's night, at least you can see what's going on kind of thing. That's what the Lord does for us. Uh, let's turn to the right to Deuteronomy. So you go through Leviticus and Numbers. And we're going to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And Moses uh, is at this point looking back on the journey. And notice how many times when we're, we're thinking about the way tonight... Uh, that the commandments come up in connection with it, specifically the commandments. The word and the commandments come up as, as something that guides us on the way. Let's read the first couple of verses there. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. Mm. So it's not a, an idle thing. This is part of the covenant. Uh, the Lord gives us commandments and then we need to do them and then we'll get the result of that. Go and, on. and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. He oh. led you all the way. 40 years in the wilderness, the Lord led you. Now, you remember, don't you, friends, that there was a point uh, when they were on the Sinai Peninsula there um, where they had the option of going straight into the land pretty quickly. And they were afraid and they didn't want to go in. And so they wandered for another 40 years out in the wilderness. And yet here it's saying that the Lord led them all the way. So even though they made kind of, quote unquote, the wrong choice, they said, we're scared. We don't want to go in. The enemy's too large and everything. Still, the Lord said, okay, he led them. All right, I'll, I'll continue leading you. you know, so it's not as though they just made the wrong choice and then he stopped leading them. He was able to lead them all that way. And then it says why he led them. 
to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, mm. whether you would keep his commandments or not. Yes, that's kind of a striking thing, isn't it? That he, that he led them all the 40 years in the wilderness. But it's not just simply like come this way, but he was finding out what they were made of during that, that process, that that was a humbling process. Uh, they were being tested and the Lord was learning what was in their heart, whether they really cared about keeping his commandments or not during that time. I don't think it has any application to our lives. Mm. Just mm. Probably, I, I didn't think so. No, I, I don't think so. Uh, how about Deuteronomy 31? I think we're just going to go from one into the other. We're, we're not going to hopefully go out of see, sequence here tonight. In Deuteronomy uh, 31, there's a negative statement in verse... Uh, Okay, let's read in verse 28. This is sort of a, Moses kind of gets intense there, and, and there's chapter 32 in Deuteronomy, it's called the Song of Moses, which is a kind of harshly critical song about the people. And this is what he says right before the Song of Moses. Gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their hearing and call heaven and earth to witness against them. Uh-oh. For I know that after my death you will become utterly corrupt and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. Listen to that. So he refers to his own commandments as the way. That's the way that I commanded you. And I know after I die, you're, you're going to abandon it. You're going to abandon the way. And what will happen? And evil will befall you in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Yes, and then he sang this song of Moses, uh, which was all about promises if they do good things and curses if they don't and that type of thing. Uh, so I was interested in that statement that Moses said, <laughs> his dying words were, you are going to abandon the way that I've commanded to you. I, I told you which way to go, but you're going to go in a different direction. So that does imply that the way involves uh, living, living in good ways, living a good life, does it not? Mm -hmm. That that's what you have to do. It's not about leading an evil life. The Lord can lead us from wherever we are, but what it's talking about here is um, that path that we follow when we're following the Lord and trying to obey the commandments in His Word. Joshua chapter 1 is just a passage that has come back to me again recently. I just love this. You may know the circumstance where Moses had led the people all those years. I think he started when he was 80 and stopped when he was 120 or something like that. Uh, anyway, he, he, after a long buildup, then he finally led the children of Israel, <laughs> wandered with them in the wilderness, but was not allowed to go into the Holy Land. It died on Mount Nebo on the other side of the water. And uh, Joshua was his successor. And this is the speech of the Lord to Joshua on his first day on the job. So you can imagine if you're taking over for the CEO of you know, whatever it is or something, it, kind of an intense moment. And will he be able to lead the people? And let's start at verse 5 in Joshua chapter 1. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Mm. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Very, very beautiful me message. I won't leave you. I won't forsake you as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Now, if that's all that you read, you would think that means the Lord has it taken care of. You know, it doesn't matter what Joshua does or how he behaves or whatever the Lord said. I'm with you no matter what kind of thing. But what does he say in the next few verses? Be strong and of good courage. Oh, huh, now that's a command. Be strong and of good courage. Now why would he need to be strong and of good courage? If the Lord was with him, you know, why wouldn't the Lord just take care of it? And it doesn't matter how he was. Go on. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Hmm. Only be strong and very courageous. Yes, so it emphasizes be strong and of good courage, and then be strong and very courageous. That and, you, what, and what does he need that strength and courage for? That you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Yes, right. You need to be strong and courageous to stick. So the thing that he needs to stick with is that law. Stick with what, what the Lord, what Moses commanded from God. 
And then he says an interesting phrase here. Look at this. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Now, do you see a discrepancy between don't turn to the right hand or the left and the phrase wherever you go? It doesn't wherever you go mean wherever you go. And yet he's saying, you know, wherever you go, don't turn to the right or the left. <laughs> that would be odd instructions if you're just trying to carry it out physically. But it shows you what he's supposed to be hanging on to. So wherever he goes, he's not supposed to turn to the right or the left from the law, you know, from what he's been taught in the word. Uh, so that he may prosper wherever he goes while he's not turning to the right hand or the left from the law. And then it makes that even more explicit in verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, mm. that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Interesting emphasis there, too, on meditating on it day and night, meditating on the book of the law. But why are you meditating? It says, so that you may observe to do according to all that's written. You know, you don't just meditate on it to know it or to memorize it or to hear a nice, you know, comforting scripture or something. You have to do according to all that's written in it. So this book of the law, and what an interesting phrase. This book of the law shall not depart. What did it say? It shall not depart. From to the right, to the left. Uh, in verse 8, the beginning of the, where is it not supposed to depart from? Do not depart from your mouth. From your mouth. It's an odd place to keep your book. But, but it's about, isn't it about saying it like you're, like you're reciting it or, or whatever, and that it's always in your, in your speech. And in, so it's in the words that you're saying. It's in the things that you're doing. And what is the promise at the end of that verse? Uh, that you may observe all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Aha! Uh -huh. So the way that you're going to make your way prosperous and the way to have good success is to follow the, you know, follow the instructions. Uh, that's the way it's supposed to work. So you see what I'm talking about, that you need to have the Lord to tell you our salvation, what Swedenborg refers to as our regeneration, which is a biblical term, uh, is not uh, something we invent. We don't sit down and create a five-year strategic plan for our self-amazing renewal or something. You know, it doesn't work. The Lord has a plan. He's laid out what the plan is then we need to follow that. Then we have freedom. We can follow it or not follow it. And this all just seems way too obvious to say, except that there are millions, if not billions of people on the planet who don't think it works this way. And that's what's so interesting to me, that these other views are very, very strong. And they almost act as though this would be, it's too, you know, it's kind of mind boggling. It's unfathomable. You mean it's both that God does it, but also we have to do it and we do it together. You know, it's too complicated. We can't fit it in our heads. It's either me or it's God, but I can't, I can't handle both. Uh, but that's what we're reading there, isn't it? And then look at verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. As I remember, he did command that a couple of times already, didn't he? Be strong and of good courage. Only be strong and very courageous. Haven't I commanded you? I love, there's something about that. I just love it. Haven't I commanded you? And then he adds something to it. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord not? your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go, that's right. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So there, what that suggests to me is that when we're following the Lord, what, what we're supposed to follow, isn't the implication of that, what we're supposed to follow is our best idea of what the Word is teaching, right? We're supposed to practice whatever we understand at a given moment that is. But there will be, that doesn't mean we won't be wandering. That doesn't even mean we won't make the wrong decision about whether to go in the Holy Land early or take the long roundabout scenic route or something. Uh, but the Lord is with us, just like that pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. The Lord is with us wherever we go if we're following that thing. That's how we develop that crucial relationship with the Lord that guides us so that the Lord's knowledge of where we're going uh, can kick in and lead us, direct us in our lives. 
I just love that passage so much. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's very reassuring, but it's also very clear of like, hey, Joshua, you know, it's on you. I'm going to be with you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. But there's something you have to do. You've got to be strong. You've got to be courageous. And the main thing you've got to be strong and courageous about is following this law. I'll take care of the rest of it. And there's a lot to it. And only God knows how that whole complicated story goes. But there's something that we can follow like that. Let's turn to the right to the Psalms. You can plow through a whole bunch of things there and get to the middle of your Bible. I want to look right at Psalm 1 right there. Because this also talks about meditating and stuff, meditating on the law. Let's read the whole psalm, all of six verses. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I love that. There, there's just three different ways not to proceed. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't stand in the way of sinners. Don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Anybody been there? I've been in all those places. I'm very familiar with those places. Thank you. Go on. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Mm. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Oh, just like Joshua. He meditates in his law day and night. And what will he be like? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water mm. that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Well, there's that word again, that will prosper. And yet this is, that was, that was sort of a sojourning or moving. Wherever you go, you'll prosper. But this is a tree that's fixed in one spot mm. uh, by the waters. Um, but whatever he does will prosper. Go on. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Mm. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor mm. sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly <clears throat> shall perish. So you see why that came to mind uh, tonight. Mm. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows how it is that the righteous are supposed to live. And I would add to that that I think one reason the Lord set it up that way is because you are not becoming me and I'm not becoming you. That's not where the Lord is taking us. He's taking each one of us on an individual journey. It's not that we don't go with other people and that we don't affect other people. It's very much of a community thing. But there's also a uniqueness to each individual. Everybody is their own love and their own understanding. And the Lord has something in mind for us, a heaven for us, uh, that's our own little piece of spiritual territory. Like nobody else is thinking in that spot that we'll be thinking. And nobody else is loving in exactly that spot that we'll be loving in. And the Lord wants to take us there. And so this journey that we're on, that's why it's so important to get hooked up with the Lord because He not only knows in general how the story goes, but He knows our story and, and where He would dearly love to bless us and make us happy. Uh, and we don't, you know, we hardly have a clue who we are or, what, you know, how to, you know, the Lord has to know that way. He's got to be the one to take us there. Uh, so he knows the way of the righteous. And it's not just in a general way. And it's not like everybody just does all the same things in lockstep. It, we are becoming individuals. In fact, as you know, friends, if you've read a lot of Swedenborg, you know this crazy idea that even though he says there are whole cities, there are large cities, there are towns and villages and so on in the spiritual world, but he says the best angels dwell apart by themselves and yet they have this outreach to the whole of heaven. They're the most unique individual. Do you know any unique individuals that are uniquer than the other unique individuals you know? <laughs> and there, there are some people who just seem like way out in their own like, I don't know anybody else like that, you know? And then there are other people who are clustered together like uh, children around a soccer ball before they learn how the game goes, and, uh, which is fine too. The Lord's fine with either way, the swarms of fish or the, or the loner and so on. But, um, but it's amazing to me that idea that there are these angels that are positioned in a particular spot that's not much covered by angels, at least other angels, at least not yet. 
uh, but they have this wide outreach. The best angels have this huge outreach, and, and they're just they're singular. Well, how do you you don't get there by following the crowd, right? You're going somewhere that other people aren't. And uh, Swedenborg also says that when when we die, we become spirits in the world of spirits. And uh, after we go through some training and so on, if we're if we're if we've chosen for heaven, uh, then we go on paths. And he says that no angel knows those paths. They're, they're known to the Lord alone. He knows exactly how to get us just to that eternal home. It's just an awesome thought that no. And you you can ask angels, should I go here? Should I go there? I don't know. Try this. Try that. Ask somebody when you get there, but the, but the Lord guides, guides us on that, on that journey home. So if no angel knows it, you know, we have really dependent on the Lord to know the way. And therefore, what we need to do is not to invent the way or, or try to imagine something or try to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps, but just to get connected with the Lord, get used to following the pillar of cloud by day, fire by night so that we can be taken to that unique place that the Lord wants to take us. Uh, let's look at Psalm 32, shall we? It's such a pleasure to be with you, friends. And I can't think of anything more important to do than to just meditate on the Word. Okay, look at Psalm 32, verses 8 and 9. This is the Lord speaking, I believe. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. There you go. See, the Lord says, I'll, I'll teach you. I'll teach you in the way you should go. And I think that's quite singular. You know, that's for each of us. I'll teach you the way. And then what does he say? I will guide you with my eye. With my eye. That's amazing. See, the Lord's understanding. Think about the Lord's eye. One thing he's got that we sometimes lack is a perspective of all eternity and infinity. Somewhat. I sometimes, I, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I'm sometimes not aware of all infinity and eternity. And uh, the Lord can see that whole thing. And so his eye, we need his eye to guide us. And then what should we not be like? Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding. Oh, hmm. Which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. <laughs> Okay, interesting advice right after that. So the Lord wants to lead us, and he's not looking for farm animals here. You know, he's not looking for just stick a ring through your nose and just haul you, you know, through the street or something on a rope. That's not what he's looking for in human beings. That's why it's so important, this idea that Swedenborg says of the as of self. I, that's actually a, a phrase that comes from uh, Second Corinthians, I believe. But the... Um, uh, the as of self is this idea that we have to exercise our own free will and choice to move in a given direction. We read the word and we think, okay, I should move in this direction. But believing that it's the Lord who's doing it with us. So he's not looking for, sometimes you hear these things in Christianity that sound like, you know, he's just looking for an army of remote control robots or something. He can just sort of control the human race. Uh, he's not looking for that. He's not looking for us to have a, a bit and a bridle in our mouths and all that. Uh, he wants us to have understanding. Isn't that the implication? Mm -hmm. Don't be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding. He does want us, the Lord knows the way, but he does want us to have some comprehension and some growing comprehension of which way it is, at least so we know the rough direction, like, Yes, we're headed north to the Holy Land or something so that we know approximately where we're going because it's not just supposed to be like a dumb animal being led along. Have a look at Psalm 40. I just love this passage, so I just throw it in gratuitously. It really has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Let's look at the first two verses there. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. Mm. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. Isn't that wonderful? So that's what we're looking for. Have you ever experienced yourself? I've certainly experienced myself in that horrible pit and the miry clay. In fact, I think about that quite a bit. What a picture that is of not being able to get your life going or you know, just feeling stuck and so on. 
And what a beautiful thing that the Lord is able to get us out of the pit, out of the miry clay, set our feet on the rock, which is, of course, an image of the Lord and his divine truth, and establish our steps, or in the language of the old King James, our goings. Uh, then we can, you know, then our movement is from the Lord, isn't it? Then we start to get traction and we start to see change happening in our lives. That's a very beautiful thing. Okay. Oh, let's look at Proverbs. You ready for some Proverbs? It's right next to the Psalms there. And let's go to Proverbs chapter 12. I'm telling you, some of these Proverbs are so great. Mm, 12 verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Ah. But he what did you who, say? But he who heeds counsel is wise. Okay, say that again. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Oh, see, that's, <laughs> that's the hazard, isn't it? We can be foolish as the day is long, and we think we're just charging down the right path. We got that confidence. And um, wow, it's right in our own eyes. But what did that other passage say? Are we following our own eyes? We're following the Lord's eye. Right? His understanding. That's what we want to be following. So that's kind of alarming. That uh, That's mm. part of the point is that we can really fool ourselves into thinking we're on a good path. That's why we need to make every effort that we can to get hooked up with the Lord, to understand the Word, try to do it the Lord's way rather than following our own foolish way. Uh, Proverbs 14, verse 12. This is even a little worse, I would say. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Oh, <laughs> that's a little problem, <laughs> it isn't it? Right. So it seems right. So you can even really think you're, no, I'm, no, this is a good, this is where I need to go. Any of you have had, uh, Children may have been told at certain times that, no, this is, you know, this is the right path for me. And you know it's not a good direction for them. There's, so there's a way that seems right to us. Seems right to us, but it's not leading in a good direction. It's leading to spiritual death. Uh, look at Proverbs 16, verses 2 and 3. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. Oh, there we go again. Oh, it's not only right, it's also pure. No, my way is good. My way is good. It's a good way. But? But the Lord weighs the spirits. Uh-huh. And the next verse? Commit your works to the Lord, mm. and your thoughts will be established. Yes, I like that. <laughs> See what I mean? It's got the remedy right there, that what we need to do is commit our works to the Lord, and then our thoughts will be established. Didn't it say established about, or some word like that for getting out of that miry clay, that you start to get traction and you get going? So it's just another warning. This is the problem. Like we can be wrong about whether, you know, whether we're going in the right direction or not. That's why we need the Lord. We need the Lord and he needs us to respond. Uh, look at chapter 20, verse 24. This one just came uh, to me right before Bible study, and I was so thrilled to find it. A man's steps are of the Lord. Oh, look at that. How then can a man understand his own way? That's the essence of what I'm talking about. <laughs> Where we're going is of the Lord. How can we, the Lord wants us to understand, but we, we can't possibly fully comprehend what he's doing, especially when he's going against the delights of our lower selves and things like that, like, Whoa, that's not the direction I wanted to go in and so on. But our steps are of the Lord. How can we understand our own way? It, we're not going to be able to invent a heaven and pull ourselves by the bootstraps into the heaven we've invented. That's not how it works. Thankfully, the Lord's yoke is easier than that and his burden is lighter that we don't have to invent heaven and know every single detail about it and exactly where we're headed. We just need to be able to find the Lord and get hooked up with him. And then he can take us step by step on the way there. And look at 21 verse 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, oh. but the Lord weighs the hearts. Uh-huh. Yep. 
so there it is again. Just, we, you know, we have this tendency to feel like we're on the right track no matter what. But the Lord can humble us and, and lead us in the right direction. That's excellent. Uh, all right. And we got that other one, did we? Yes, we did. Okay. Let's go to, oh, this is so great. Isaiah chapter 30. So turn to the right and we'll go to Isaiah. There's another favorite passage that I just can't ever help throwing into Bible study. We read it may, way more than we need to. But, uh, uh, oh, let's read from verse, uh, oh, let's read from verse 18. What the heck? Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice, Blessed are all those who wait for him. Mm. Keep Go going. On. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Yes, that's like that cry from the pit, isn't it? Person cried from the pit. I think this is partly, there's, it suddenly strikes me that there's sort of a little hint there because I've been meditating at the marvel of how we ever get hooked up with the Lord. Given the lives of our own lower selves to begin with, how would we ever, why would we ever make that step? But I think it's because you realize something from the Lord in you realizes you're stuck in the miry clay and you want to get out. And so our crying to the Lord is such an important first step. And it says the Lord will be gr very gracious to you at the, at the voice of our cry. Go on. Uh, verse 20 there. Verse 20. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, mm. yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. So I'm not saying it's all going to be a, a smooth ride. Obviously, the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness didn't have a smooth ride the whole time. So you will still have the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, such fascinating, super biblical kind of phrases. But your teachers are not going to be removed anymore. But your eyes will see your teachers. And here's the verse I love in verse 21. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. Isn't that fascinating? That's and we just heard in Joshua, it said, Don't turn from the law to the right hand or to the left, uh, that you may prosper wherever you go. And here it says, when you turn to the right, or when, so that was talking about turning to the right or the left from the law, like departing from the law in either direction. Uh, but this is saying, when you're walking along, you'll hear a word behind you that says, this is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right and when you turn to the left. So as you make those decisions, something with you is saying, yes, you're on the right track, keep going, that's good. I love that idea. I don't think that's an early or a young regenerative state. I think that takes a while to get to, but that's a, something devoutly to be wished. Turn to the right to Jeremiah chapter 5. So excited. We never run out of biblical scriptures, do we? It's so great. Just like those vessels that just have this unending oil in them. Okay. Oh, I'd like to read... Let's see, shall we read these first five verses in Jeremiah chapter 5? Let's do that. Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know, and seek in her open places, if you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. Mm. Though they say, as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. O Lord, are not your eyes on the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. Now listen to that. You've stricken them, but they haven't grieved. Go on. You have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. See, even what <laughs> seems like affliction and, and that from the Lord is his desire to change us, to improve us. Go on. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to return. Refused to return. Okay, go on. Therefore I said, surely these are poor. They are foolish, for they do not know the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. So I, that implies <clears throat> that there is a need in us to know something about the way of the Lord. 
Like you can't walk on the way of the Lord if you know nothing about it. It says they're poor, they're foolish, they don't know the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. And go on, verse 5. I will go to the great men and speak to them, for they have known the way of the Lord. They've known it. Right. The judgment of their God. But. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Uh, yeah, so even those ones who should know the way of the Lord, they've, they've rebelled against it and so on. Isn't there a theme in these passages? Doesn't it seem like there's a theme there? And check out Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, which would be central to our topic tonight. O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Listen to that. Can you read that again? That's just so beautiful. O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. Mm, the way of man. So that's what I'm talking about. Our way is not in ourselves. It's not that first theory that I talked about tonight, that we just will just be a self-made person and we'll just, you know, squeeze ourselves into some new mold or something like that. Uh, the prophet is saying, I know that, the, that our way is not in ourselves. And then what's the next phrase? It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Yes. So people who are walking, it's not in them to direct their own steps. That's what I'm talking about. If we direct our own steps, then we're on those ways of the fool that seem right and so on. But we're deceiving ourselves. But if we're hooked up with something from the Lord, then our steps are being directed more like that word that you hear behind you that says, this is the way, walk in it when you're on the right track. How sweet is that, right? This was written thousands of years before the whole uh, science of philosophy or the science of psychology was born. And yet, look at that. It's such awesome truth. Uh, let's look at Daniel. So turn to the right. We'll go through Ezekiel to Daniel. Look at chapter 5. We've just got a few more of these gems here. And this was amazing because I think we read this just last week when we were talking about breath. I find this quite often. When I come up with these Bible study topics completely independently of each other most of the time. And then I look up passages under a completely different set of parameters and we end up in the same place we were last week. So let's read that long verse, verse 23. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. Now it's just like that last week when we were talking about no breath at all. There's no, they have no breath at all. And... And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Yes, that's such a powerful message, isn't it? Yeah. So your breathing is in the Lord's hand and he owns all your ways. Isn't that a nice way to put it? Mm. Who, owns, who owns all your ways. Uh, you have not glorified the God who's actually in charge of everything about your life and everything that you're doing. Okay, good. Why not, indeed? Now, at the very end of Daniel there, you get into Hosea, which is the first of the minor prophets. And I'd like to go to the end of Hosea and read in chapter 14. Oh, man. How are we doing for time? We're doing pretty well. Let's read all nine verses, shall we? O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Hmm. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity, receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Yes. Assyria shall not save us. Mm. We will not ride on horses, mm. nor will we say any more to the work of our hands, you are our gods, for in you the fatherless finds mercy. There's another reference to idols and the work of our own hands and so on. I will hear their backsliding, I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. Mm. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree, 
and his fragrance like Lebanon. So you see what's going on here is the Lord is saying that he's going to call the people back and bring them into this gorgeous state, this beautiful state where the beauty of the people will be like an olive tree and they'll have that sweet aroma of the cedars of Lebanon and so on. In verse 7. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Mm. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? Mm. I have heard and observed him. Mm. I am like a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found in me. Yes, and so uh, Ephraim, Ephraim has to do with the intellect, the mind. So the mind giving up all your idols, those things that you believed and kind of worshipped, those ideas that were so central to you that weren't even true. And Ephraim says, what have I to do any more with idols? And then look at this last verse here. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. Mm, for? But, for the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Yeah, the ways of the Lord are right. He knows, he knows the way. The Lord knows the way. And the just will walk in them but transgressions fall in them. Same kind of message we've been hearing all evening, right? Mm -hmm. So now, let's go on an adventure. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai. It might be easier for you, I wanna go to Haggai chapter two. It might be easier to go to Matthew and go back, Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai. Um, chapter two, now, you remember in Joshua chapter 1 that the Lord said to Joshua three times, Be strong and of good courage. Only be strong and very courageous. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. But meditate in this book of the law and keep, it, keep the law in your mind. Meditate on it day and night. So look at Haggai 2 verses 4 and 5. This is from a very late time when the people had been exiled from the land, they were brought back into the land, they were supposed to rebuild the temple, but they hadn't gotten around to it yet. And this is what the Lord says to them. Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel. There's says, be strong. <clears throat> right? Says the Lord. And be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work. And work. Hear that? So there are four commands in there. Be strong. Be strong, be strong, and work. That's what the Lord wants us to do. For, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Doesn't that have it it's nice and neat all in one verse there that we have to do things, we have to be strong, for the Lord is with us. That's right. And isn't it interesting that of those three people, or three categories, Zerubbabel, Joshua, and all the people of the land who are told to be strong, one of them just happens to be named Joshua, and the person who was told to be strong in Joshua chapter 1, mm. was named Joshua. Be strong. And Joshua is actually the same name as Jesus. Too much to think about. Verse 5. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Isn't that very much like the charge to Joshua? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written in it. According to the word, and isn't that wonderful? It doesn't say, according to the document that I gave you. He says, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. I've added that to my little anxiety meds uh, list, by the way. Haggai 2, verses 4 and 5. I also added Joshua 1, verses 5 to 9, in case you're keeping up in the color supplements. And let's go into the New Testament now. We just got three scriptures up here. Go all the way to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. How could we not read that tonight? Let's read those first six verses. Very, 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 very familiar verses. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Hmm. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Mm. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, 
there you may be also. Isn't that a beautiful image of what we've been talking about all night? That the Lord knows our place and he's going to go and prepare a place for us and he's going to come back and yes. take us there. Yeah. He knows the way. We don't, have to, we don't have to know the way. Okay, and what does he say? And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Oh, well, wait a minute. Doesn't that contradict what I just said? Yes, it does. How does Thomas react? Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? That's great. <laughs> if you don't know where somebody's going, then I don't know how to get there. <laughs> I don't know where that is. <laughs> and what does Jesus say? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yes, isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. So there it is that the Lord is, it's not just that our title tonight is that the Lord knows the way. It's not just that the Lord knows the way. He is the way. Now, there's a couple of different ways of understanding that. But one way to understand it might be to think that all you have to do is believe in the Lord or say his name or something like that. And that, that'll do it. That's all you have to do. But all these other scriptures we've been reading have been talking about how we have to walk in the way of the Lord. Don't turn from it to the right hand of the left. Observe to, according to all that's written in the, the commandment and the law of Moses and so on. So it's very important that we go, but the Lord is that law. He is his own law and his own order. And so he goes and prepares a place for everyone, an individual place. And then he's going to come to us again. And he is the way. He knows the way. He, he knows how to get us to where we need to go. Not beautiful. Okay, let's turn to the right, and we, we're headed for Philippians. So we go through Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and we get to Philippians. And look at chapter 2 there. Very, very striking statement. I think Scripture has a difficult job to try to communicate both to us that we cannot do it without the Lord, but also to communicate that we have to do it. We have to do as much as we can. Uh, look at verse, let's say, uh, verses 12 and 13 here. This is Paul writing to the Philippians. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Wow. Work out your own salvation. That sounds a little bit like it runs counter to what we've been talking about tonight. Certainly runs counter to the idea of faith alone and all you do is believe in the Lord and that's it. That is your salvation. It says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I think that's an important thing according to that appearance, the as of self that we do it ourselves. But look at the very next verse. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Yes. Uh, why do we have to work out our own salvation? Because it's God in us, working in us, both to will and to do His good pleasure. It's the Lord who gives us the will. It's the Lord who gives us the action. So our ability to walk on that path comes from the Lord. And that's why, isn't that great? In verse 12, you have, the, you have to do it. And in verse 13, the Lord is the one who's doing it. You know, they're, they're side by side there, right in the text. And turn to the right and go to Colossians chapter 1. Because there's a statement from Paul here that just, I thought, kind of points to this nicely. Let's pick up at verse 27. You're always in the middle of a sentence with Paul. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Think of that phrase, Christ in you, the Lord in you. That's what, we're, that's what we want, right? The Lord in us and we're in the Lord so that we're on that journey with the Lord and he's right there guiding us, that cloud of uh, the cloud and the fire and so on. Go on. Um, the hope of glory, is it 28? Yes. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Perfect in Christ Jesus. So having to do with that regeneration process. And perfect, in my view, so often has to do with love. As we talked about before in Bible study, that means that you've come through to that point. It doesn't mean 
you do everything precisely and accurately and you never do anything wrong, but it means that you've been perfected in love, the scripture says sometimes. And then look at this last verse. It's got an interesting little thing in here. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. <laughs> How great is that? Do you see the as of self in that passage? Read it again. So, so Paul says, I'm laboring for this. Isn't that where he starts? Mm -hmm. To this end I also labor. I, I also labor. To this end I also labor. Striving. striving. So who's striving? That's Paul striving, right? So I labor. I'm striving. According to his working. According to, oh wait, well who's doing it? So the Lord is doing it according to his, so I'm striving according to his working, which does what? It works in me mightily. It works in me mightily. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? So that's got the whole thing in there. Paul is working, he's striving, but he acknowledges at the same, this is exactly what, what Swedenborg talks about so often, that you both have to act as if the whole thing is on your own shoulders and at the same time have to intellectually acknowledge that the Lord is the one doing the work. And Paul has done that magnificently in a single verse there. I labor, striving according to his working, who works in me mightily. That the Lord is, is working in Paul. So, now it's all fine to say, oh yeah, just follow the Lord. That's right. Just follow the Lord. Follow an invisible person you've never seen and you don't know who, who that is or where he is in your life. Um, how do you follow the Lord? Well, the, he has identifying attributes or characteristics. And so here's just a little hint, good friends. I'm sure you've got better ones yourselves. That the Lord, one thing that the Lord is, is he is what is called order. He's ordered. There's this beautiful passage that Swedenborg says that where the Lord is, order is present, and where order is, the Lord is present. Uh, so you may not be able to tell in your life, oh, that's the Lord God, Jesus Christ. But it might be easier for us to tell, oh, I think I can see which is the orderly way and which is the disorderly way in this situation. So that's something we can follow. We can follow things like love as best we can see them. Love, wisdom, mercy, compassion, so on. Yeah, oh, I, that, that would not be compassionate. To take revenge would not be compassionate. This is compassionate. So I think the Lord is in this direction. So you don't have to know all about it. You just have these, these sort of yardsticks or things that, that measure your progress. So it's not that you are going to spend that whole walk necessarily beholding the, the glistening face of Jesus in your mind's eye. If that happens, that's absolutely wonderful. But, but sometimes what we need to go for are these qualities, some sort of direction that we get from the Word. And that's why we meditate in the Word day and night to try to see day and night. Isn't that interesting? Pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, day and night, day and night to meditate in the Lord's Word to try to get that sense of that leading where is the Lord taking us? What are we doing? We are not led like farm animals with a yoke, with a thing in our nose or on a rope or something. Like that. Don't expect the Lord to be dragging you around by the neck or something. He believes massively in freedom. Freedom is even more important than salvation because it's crucial to salvation. And so you've got to understand we're, we're not animals. We're not just going to be yanked along in this way. Uh, the Lord wants us to cooperate. He wants to have our freedom. Look at the children of Israel. They decided, ah, I'm kind of scared of going into the Holy Land. So the Lord said, okay, I will lead you through the wilderness for 40 years, and then we'll, we'll try it again when, when you feel more ready. The Lord is like that all the time. So we do have freedom. It's not an automaton kind of thing, and the Lord is not leading us all to precisely the same spiritual place, but it's all the same direction of moving towards love toward humility toward service and 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 toward greater even greater freedom we cooperate as best we can we don't know our own evil we don't know what heaven is truly like we don't know our place in it we don't know where we are now or how to get from here to there uh, and we fool ourselves and sometimes hell deceives us but if we meditate in the lord's word day and night 
and attempt to deploy its principles in our lives, we gradually establish a relationship with this guide himself. And this is the sense in which he is the way. He is that word behind us that says, this is the way. Sometimes, you may have heard me share about this before, sometimes after you make a decision, then you feel good, like that was good. The Lord's presence in us is that freedom. And so we may be waiting for the Lord to push us one way or the other, but he's just there in that freedom waiting for us. Uh, so to reach salvation, we don't need to invent heaven. We don't need to pull ourselves there by our own bootstraps. We mainly need to find and follow the Lord, and the Lord is right here in the pages of the Word, in that cloud that can lead us along the way. Thank you for your kind attention, good friends. Let's close with a prayer, shall we? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I'm thinking of that poem about the footsteps of how often we feel alone when you're even closer than ever to us. Often this journey is difficult for us. You know that we will be experiencing the bread of adversity, the water of affliction as we journey. But as we look back, Lord, and especially as we look long into the past, we see the hand of your leading sometimes. Sometimes when we're up on the mountain, we can see that you've been leading us along and you know the way. In fact, we marvel sometimes. How did you ever convince us to go on this journey with you? We don't even know how it got started because we didn't know who you were or where we were going. But we thank you for leading us along, Lord. Thank you for bringing us along. And thank you for knowing the way. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's keep on meditating on the word day and night. Surprise you. Thank you, friends. God bless.